Good day, and it's good to be here with you uh, for today's message. And as I always say, thank you so much for inviting me into your spaces and places, however you do that. And um, just as a reminder, right off the get-go here, last week we began a new sermon series in the book of Daniel. We're calling it uh, Sifting Sands, uh, Living a Godly Life in an, uh, in an Ungodly World. Today we're going to be in uh, Daniel chapter 2. So with no further ado, uh, let's begin. 19th century Christian apologist, educator, and children's storyteller C.S. Lewis once said, quote, What Satan put into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could be like gods, could set up on their own as if they had created themselves. And none of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which to make him happy. As I mentioned, we cracked open the ancient book of Daniel last week in chapter 1. And within this book, you will find a 2,600-year-old story which includes ambition, war, empire, slavery, power, and selfish pride, amongst many other things. So indeed, C.S. Lewis unintentionally here in a way describing a key character in this book, King Nebuchadnezzar, who by his own attitudes and actions, and in many other ways, certainly must have uh, looked like or thought of himself as close to a god as possible in his day. For he possessed the power and the will he, to decree a people to be enslaved, the power and the will to decree the people to worship him. We see this in Daniel to reach the very pinnacle of power and wealth and political influence and so much more in his day. And one day this self-made man, this king of Babylon, while walking on the roof of his great palace said this, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty hand, by my mighty power, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? And we see here in chapter 4, as he even was saying these words, there was a voice from heaven, who's, what, which, a voice from heaven, pardon me, that said to this king, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And from that moment, from the very pinnacle of power and might, this once prideful king lived like an animal, and he did so for seven years. And there was no more decrees coming forth from his mouth. There was no more slaves to serve him. There was no more uh, fine wine and food for the king's table. Just grass between his teeth, the cold morning dew on his back, and Nails like bird claws scratching out the next meal. We turn to Jeremiah the prophet. And he was told by God to go to the potter's house. And there he would receive a word from, the, from God. We see this in chapter 18 of Jeremiah. And upon arriving at the potter's house, he saw the potter reworking clay into a new and different vessel. And God said to Jeremiah, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, said this, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Things Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. We go to the New Testament letter written by James. And in that letter, he challenges the person who boasts about tomorrow. When he said this, Come now, 
you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Find that in chapter 4, verse 13 to 16 of James. So please turn now in your Bibles to chapter 2. We're just going to read the first 30 verses together. Um, there's just too many uh, verses here to deal with at one time. But we want to include uh, as much as we can for today's message. So chapter 2, verse two, uh, chapter two, verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then he, the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know that, to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Arama Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you, do not take, if you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its, inter and its interpretation. Verse 7. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time changes, change, the times change. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its inter interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, Arioch the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Verse 17, Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belongs wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. We know what is in the dark. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might. And you have made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed, to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to them, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. 
The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or astrologer, <coughs> astrologer can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he's made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what it is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation but may be made known to the king, and you may know the thoughts of your mind. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Mighty God, Father, we thank you for this uh, story we find here in this book of Daniel. As Daniel is being faced, is facing a very difficult time in his life. And uh, we pray, Lord, as we look at this a little closer, as we try to understand it, as we try to, to make sense of it, we pray, that, Holy Spirit, that you will lead us and guide us through this all. And that in the final analysis that we would put our full trust and faith in you, Lord God, for you are indeed sovereign over all things and nations and, and places as well in our lives. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. So last week, we first opened the book, as mentioned earlier, in chapter 1. And as we did, we were challenged and reminded of a few things. One was not to read ourselves into the story, for we are indeed not Daniel. That context was the, the rule by which we will understand this interpretation, or we'll be able to interpret, pardon me, and understand this text. And importantly, more importantly, not more importantly, but importantly, we learned that the overarching theme of the book of Daniel could be stated simply by saying God is sovereign. God is sovereign over all. And then one last point we can bring into today's uh, uh, message is we see Daniel's faithfulness to the Lord, his complete trust in the sovereignty of God, his love for the Lord and his word, which enabled Daniel to discern when to draw a line in the sand and make a stand for God. Now, this is not saying he never had doubts, but what we have here is his actions. We see him trusting the Lord. And as we were thinking about the first chapter, about him not eating the king's food and drinking the king's wine, perhaps in our modern day uh, idea, we might think that refusing to eat the king's food was rather easy uh, to draw a line on. And if that's the case, which it wasn't, certainly today here in chapter 2, we can't say the same thing. For here in chapter 2, Daniel drew no line but the king drew a firm line that would have severe consequences for very many, including Daniel and his three friends. So chapter 2 begins with King Nebuchadnezzar and his dreams. And it's a troubling dream, dreams, which kept him up and he sought the advice of the wise men, which was very common in these days. And we are told that he, the king asked the advisors not only to give him an interpretation, but first give him and described the dream itself. Now, as the story has unfolded, we know that the, the king's advisors were uh, finding themselves in very deep water. They were over their heads, in other words, and not able to do as they were asked of. We might say today they found themselves in a pickle, or they, they were up a creek without a paddle with, with the waterfall fast approaching. It would not be overstating that their lives were on the line. For we read in verse 5, the word from me is firm. This is the king speaking. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretations, you sh interpretation shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in rooms. And now he wasn't kidding. This would actually be what would happen. That's kind of their way of dealing with this sort of thing. And just our case, our 21st century sensibility suggests that King was exaggerating because I, I'm alluded to that. We see the advisors were, as the advisors were unable to do as the King asked, 
that there's a reality here now facing them in verse 12. Because of this, the king was very angry and very furious and commanded that all wise men of Babylon be destroyed. In other words, be torn limb for limb. And that would include most likely their families as well. But before we move any further, it's important to note that there's another side to this coin. Because as we read, and it's important to note that the, the king's advisors, if they would have had the ability to explain the king's dream and interpret it, they would have received, as the king said, gifts and rewards and great honor. They've been set up for life. But you see, they were not able, and their only excuse was to put it on the gods. Only the gods could do this. Well, here's the thing. In reality, these advisors really had no resources to depend on to comply to the king's wishes. And of course, their gods would never really say anything, for there were no such thing as their gods. I was thinking about Daniel, I was thinking about all the study and prepare, preparation I have been doing into, uh, the, the, in, in, in the last couple of weeks and looking around and, and just understanding that the book of Daniel really has been studied by many people, trying to understand the visions and the prophecies of Daniel. Many books have been written about it, many different opinions are, have been offered. Matter of fact, even ministries have been uh, started and driven by and moved along by the prophetic message of Daniel. I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying that's just what's happening. And of course, in biblical scholarship, there is a lot of uh, information there. It's quite an seemingly endless. Now, I don't, want us, I don't want to discourage us from diligent study of God's word. Absolutely not. But in a case like this, I think it would be to our benefit, to our profit, to step back from the details and take a look at the bigger picture that we have here in the story. We need some clarity. If we get caught up in the uh, details, we will miss some things, I believe. Because as, I, as was mentioned last week at the very introductory of this uh, series, that thus the 21st century believer really has a difficult way of framing and organizing and understanding the events that we're dealing with here in Daniel. In many ways, we are foreigners and aliens in a landscape and a story that, was, that occurred so long ago. I was thinking about our context. You know, you know for example, when corporations downsize, uh, we might lose our jobs or we might have to be posted somewhere else or move to another part of the country. We see people today changing careers as often as they might change their car or other things. And um, for us living on the North American continent, we've really been spared from some of the worst events in modern history. But let's take a, a look at the big picture of Daniel. Uh, Judah was a conquered nation. Conquered by the Babylonian king. And Daniel and his friends were taken into captivity. The royal family and the youngest and the best of the nation were taken into captivity. Their cherished Jerusalem ransacked. The temple where they met and worshipped God looted. And here Daniel and his friends were about to have their limbs torn from them because of a prideful egotistical king. So with this bigger picture in mind, it, it certainly would say, makes sense and it'd be logical to say that this book, this book of Daniel, must have been a treasured possession to the Jews. And, and let me explain. Because within this book, this uh, nation of Judah in captivity would find the hope that God had not abandoned them. That God would forgive them of their sins and restore them. That God is sovereign even over Babylon. That God is working all things out for their good according to his purposes. That his people were not forgotten. And that his covenant was with them in all their trials and troubles. And that through his people and through prophets like Daniel, that their hope was secure, that one day 
God would make all things right and he would be their God. He would dwell with them forever. This is the nature of this book, bringing this hope that that would come one day. And one day it will come. So you and I, as 21st century followers of Jesus, we have some important questions then to consider in our day, in our context, and the things that we are facing as followers of Jesus. First, do you believe God is sovereign over all the nations? And I mean, do you really believe that? And if you believe it, do you act on it? Um, do you believe God is all wise? And if you do, do you act like he is all wise? That God is all powerful. Do you believe that? And do you act like he's all powerful? And a really good question to ask yourself is, or we, we should ask ourselves as followers of Christ in our culture, what will we do if God decides to take us into a hostile and dangerous place? It might come to even our own doorsteps in this country one day. I think we can be uh, sure that Daniel and his friends and others taken into captivity were tempted to abandon God. They would have been tempted. That temptation would have been there. And they were surrounded by a very hostile, spiritually dark place. And now their very lives were threatened. Why not hightail it out on the nearest donkey and get away as far as possible, if at all possible? Or why not do the opposite, appease the king to save your necks? Do anything the king wants to save your necks. There were some options there. Yet the story reveals they didn't surrender to their situation. They didn't abandon God. They remained faithful to God and his word. You see, they had a big picture view of the context. That there was a larger purpose with God in their story. That even their circumstances and even their troubles and their trials in many ways reinforced their decision to remain faithful, to trust God, to trust his purposes, even if they didn't understand it all. And by trusting God in their situation, they were able to make wise decisions and choices. We find others like Daniel in the grand story of redemption throughout human history who put their trust in God and his sovereignty, making wise decisions and choices. For example, Joseph and Nehemiah and Esther and Mordecai, all examples like Daniel and his friends of trusting God's purposes in the face of danger. Let's get back to our story. The king had made his decision, and all the wise men, including Daniel and his three friends, would be put to death. And verse 14 to 19 of chapter 2 uh, provides us with Daniel's response to the king's edict. After getting clarification from Arioch, the captain of the guard, of what was going on. And by the way, when you read for, verse 14, he, he approached him with what the text says here, prudence and discretion. He approached and inquired of An, An, uh, Arioch with tact and, and wisdom. And when Daniel was in the loop, so to speak, he sought from the king an audience, a place that he would be able to come at one time and give the king what he asked. Then what did Daniel do? What did Daniel do? Well, he went home and explained everything to his three companions. And he told them to pray. Let's pray. And it tells us exactly here what he said. To seek mercy from God in heaven concerning this mystery. Mystery. So that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Very first thing he did was pray. So thinking back, friends, thinking back over the last couple of years, and just want to ask some questions, how did you respond to the pandemic? Uh, how did people respond around you? How many went home and prayed that God would be merciful? Or how many went out and hoarded stuff? How many, driven by fear, 
turned on their neighbors, their families, their friends, their churches, etc. Now I'm just asking these questions. Because when faced with a life and death situation, Daniel sought the mercy of God. Sought the mercy of God. Decades before Daniel, there was a king by the name of Hezekiah, a very righteous king. And he was facing the Assyrian army surrounding Jerusalem. And he went to the house of the Lord, it tells us in uh, Isaiah 37. And he, and he prayed, O Lord our God, save us, that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone are the Lord. And how did God respond in this particular situation? Well, it tells us in verse 37 of chapter, 36 of chapter 37, that the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 of the Assyrians. Of course, the king had no choice but to go away. And the text tells us further on in the story that one day while worshiping his false god, he was murdered by his own sons. We can go to Jeremiah, and, I, and I, I, one of my, he's my favorite prophet in the Old Testament. And he's often referred to as the weeping prophet because he was persecuted from the message that he brought from God. And he found himself under arrest one day, and God said to him this, Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you. Well, friends, Daniel called to God, and God answered we read this in verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Next, we have to notice how Daniel responded. It tells us in verse 19, Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Can I ask, when was the last time we blessed the God of heaven for his blessing in our lives, for answered prayer? See, we were challenged earlier by this question. What will you do if God decides to take you into a hostile place? Friends, I think we are already in a hostile place, place as followers of Christ in our culture. Will you be like Daniel? Will you be like Hezekiah, Jeremiah? Call out to God and ask for mercy and bless him. Verse 20 to 23, we can read Daniel's blessings for ourselves. You can do that on your own time. And we, can conclude, and we can conclude some things from these verses. That Daniel had a firm and clear grasp on the truth of God. First, God is sovereign over all nations and kings. And can I say this for my Canadian friends? God is sovereign over Canada and our political leaders. And I would extend that to any nation. Even Russia and Ukraine. God is sovereign in the world. Two, God is perfectly, perfectly all wise. See, Daniel appealed to the wisdom of God in his situation. We go to the New Testament letter of James, who provides the commentary for us on this topic of wisdom. James 1.5 five. James said, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So Daniel asked, and he received. And what's really important to understand is what Daniel did with the wisdom he received from God. This is a crucial, crucial point, an important point. What did he do with the wisdom? Because James also cautions, but let him ask in faith, with no doubting. It's not saying that Daniel didn't doubt, or you don't doubt, or I don't doubt. But when you come to God and ask, you come to God and ask in faith without doubting. And Daniel asked in faith, and he acted in faith. Daniel went out before the king, ready to tell him what he asked of his wise men. He wasn't like the one James describes in his letter, who doubts God. For James said, that person is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So friends, God is sovereign. God is all-powerful, all-wise. 
And John, in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 5, said this, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Or as Daniel puts it here in verse 22, the light dwells with him. And God is the one who, according to Daniel, reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness. So God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. God is all-wise. God is light. Well, as we bring this all together, I think we'll find, while we're not Daniel, we're not facing a time when we will have our limbs torn from us at this time, we, like Daniel, will have to decide how we will respond to trials and tribulations in our time and place. How we will respond, whether it's a pandemic, a culture that is increasingly growing intolerant of Christians, a health crisis in our life, a troubling and maybe dysfunctional relationship, anything, whether internal, external, or both, that challenges and tests our faith and trust in God. How will you and I respond? And how, and when we do respond, how will that impact those around us? You see, the king asked Daniel, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel's response is very, very noteworthy. No, your highness, no one in all your kingdom is able to do what you ask. But there is a God in heaven who can and has. And Daniel responded to his dire situation by faith and prayer and explained the dream and interpretation to the king. Pardon me. And later in this chapter, Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar would say, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries. So in conclusion, uh, I just want to say these last few uh, statements. If there was an appropriate statement that we could put on Daniel's epitaph, it could be no less than this. A life lived in humility before God. A life lived in humility before God. I think, though, James, in his letter, puts it best for you and me today. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. My hope and prayer for all of us is that we remain humble before Jesus in our time. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for this message of encouragement. We look at the life of Daniel and his three friends and, and, and uh, taken away from their everything they've known and their faithfulness and their desire to follow you, Lord God. I pray that we too would do that in our own time and place, no matter what comes our way. Give us the strength to do that. Give us the wisdom to understand and give us the knowledge in which to deal with it. We thank you so much for that, Lord. And I know, Lord, we will have doubts and struggles and times of wondering and moving away from you, Lord, but you are the faithful one, and we thank you for that as well. Ask your blessing on my friends, wherever they may be, from the top of their heads to the bottoms of their feet, and may they know and grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good day. Shalom.